Okay, this lecture is over module 11 of your curriculum entitled IP version 4 addressing. Uh, as far as what you will learn in this module, um, we will learn about IP version 4 addressing. We'll talk about subnetting, which is taking a network and dividing it into um, multiple smaller networks. We will also talk about variable link subnetting mask when those um, were basically subnetting, but the subnets um, that we normally created are the same size. With variable link subnetting, uh, they will be uh, different sizes. Uh, so that's what we will uh, briefly uh, learn about and why you should take this module. So we'll be talking about the address structure. We'll go back and talk about unicast, broadcast, and multicast. Uh, we'll type, talk about the different types of IP version 4 addresses, primarily public and private. But there's also some other, for example, reserved. Uh, we'll talk about um, dividing networks into um, smaller networks, which is a version of segmentation. We'll talk about subnetting a IP version 4. Uh, for what I said, we'll, we'll take a given subnet, for example, here they're talking about a slash 24 and dividing it into uh, multiple smaller networks. We'll also talk about the thing about doing a slash 16 and doing a slash 8. We'll talk about subnetting to meet requirements. We'll talk about variable link subnetting mask, which I already explained, and we'll talk about how we go through and do a structured design so that we end up with a, a good uh, network design with minimal waste of IP addresses. So when we talk about the structure of an IP version 4 address, we've at least briefly mentioned this in the past, uh, we have a dividing point somewhere uh, between the second and third bit or the 29th and 30th bit uh, that we use to divide a uh, address into a network portion and a host portion. Uh, when IP version 4 was originally implemented decades ago, uh, that division happened on one of the dots in the decimal dotted notation. Um, and we have different classes of uh, networks um, which we will talk about um, in 11.3. Uh, but the main thing is we have a dividing point. Uh, the way we determine where that dividing point is is using the subnet mask. And basically they're showing you a Windows TCP IP version 4 uh, property. And uh, we have 255, 255, 255.0 as our subnet mask. So a subnet mask is a series of ones followed by a series of zeros. So in this case, we have 24 ones followed by eight zeros. Where we switch from ones to zeros is the dividing point. So that's how we know that the, the network portion is 192.168.10 and then a particular host within that network is the .10. Um, so that's how we go through and um, or what the purpose of the subnet mask and what the subnet mask is um, telling us. Um, so that's how subnet masks were originally um, shown. Uh, like I said, a bunch of ones followed by a bunch of zeros. Uh, if a whole octet is full of ones, it is the maximum value for 8 bits, which is 255. If it is all zeros, of course, the value is zero, and we change that to decimal dotted notation. Uh, down here, um, they're talking about uh, going through and um, dividing these. We'll talk about how we and these in a bit, but again, everything's converted to binary. All these bits stay in the subnet portion and this is the the host portion where we have the ones in the subnet mask. 
So this is how subnet masks were originally shown. Um, as time went on and as we started using IP version 6, which is what I think really started us to cause us to use this in IP version 4, we have something called the, the, the prefix length. Uh, what the prefix length is, is instead of giving a subnet mask, we do slash in a number. And that number tells us how many ones are in the subnet mask. So slash 8 is, as we'll see in a moment, a class A subnet up to the first decimal. Slash 16 is a class B. Slash 24 is a class C. And then they're just showing us further doing uh, subnets. And like I said, slash 2 is the smallest, and slash 30 uh, is, is the largest we can have. And when we start talking about number of hosts in a subnet, or the number of subnets that we have, we'll, we'll find out why that is the case. So, um, down here, we talk about logical AND, and usually... I draw a truth table to talk about this in the beginning and basically have a column A and a column B. Um, and then I'll start out writing false, 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 true, true, false, true, true on the left side of the truth table. The right side of the truth table would be A and B. So A and B is true if both A and B is true. The only place that would be, we would have false, 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 true in that truth table. Uh, if we convert the falses to zeros and the trues to one, uh, what we would have, um, that's the normal representation of true and false in a programming language. Uh, so we would change the truth table to look more like what they have here. Now, if I did this truth table, I would do zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Uh, the reason I would do that is that because that's the representation of uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. I would do them in order. And then, of course, if that was the case, um, 0, 0 would be 0, 0, 1 would be 0, 1, 0 would be 0, and 1, 1 would be 1, as they've shown here. So I don't really like the way uh, they've done the truth table. Now, down here, uh, what they're doing is they're taking an IP version 4 address in binary, a subnet mask in binary, and they're doing something called a bitwise AND. That is bit by bit, so the first bit, second bit, third bit, etc., all the way up to the 32nd bit. Uh, so true and true is true. True and true is true. False and true is false. So what they basically do is they're going through and one by one doing um, the AND truth table uh, bit by bit. Now, one thing that I point out is, and usually students get this first one, I say, if you AND anything with a zero, what do you get? Well, the answer is, it's you get a zero. If that one is false, there's no combination that's going to make the result true. Um, I then turn around and say, what happens if you AND something with a one. And a lot of times I get a puzzled look and I, I have to explain this. But if you have a zero, you end it with a one, you get a zero. If you have a one and you end it with a one, you get a one. So basically you get what you started with. So if you look down here, every place we ended this with a one, we got the exact same value we started with. So 192.168.10 is exactly the same. Now here we had some ones and zeros. Everything with the zero is zero, so these all become zeros. So by doing a bitwise AND on an IP address and the associated subnet mask, you end up with what is called the network number. The network number is where all of your host bits are set to zero. Uh, I'll go ahead and mention it. I don't know when we get to this. But if you set all the host bits to 1, which in this case would be 192.168.10.255, .10 .255, 
you have the broadcast address for that network. Um, another concept we'll talk about is um, pretty quick is usable host. Um, so we have 256 possible combinations from 0 to 255, but 0 is the network number, 255 is the broadcast address, so we have 254 usable addresses if we take out that network number and that broadcast. Um, here is a video. It's six minutes and um, 20 seconds long, but I think it's important to go ahead and, and uh, play this in line uh, with the, the lecture because subnetting and talking about network host and broadcast addresses is very important. portion. A network can be thought of as a range of addresses. All devices on the same network have the same bit pattern for their network ID, but they will have a different host ID. Some addresses in this range are reserved and have a special name and meaning. For example, the first address in the range is used to identify the network itself and cannot be assigned to any host. It is referred to as the network address. The last in the range is called the broadcast address and is used to send a message to all devices on the network at once. It also cannot be assigned to any host. All the IP addresses between the network and the broadcast addresses make up the usable or valid host range and can be used to address the hosts on the network. Let's take a look at how these addresses are determined. In order to forward data, a device needs to know what network it's on using their host IP address, their subnet mask, and a process called binary anding, a device can find what's referred to as the network address. This address represents the network to which the host belongs and will be slightly different than its host IP. To do this, the device compares their host IP and their subnet mask bit for bit. If the bit values are both a binary one, the result is a binary one. If one or both of the bit values is zero, the result is a binary zero. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say we have a PC with a host IP address and a subnet mask of 192.168.2.38/24, and we'll use anding to find the network address of the host. Here's the host IP in binary. Here's the subnet mask in binary. If we compare them bit for bit, we can see that a 1 and a 1 results in a 1, a 1 and a 1 results in a 1, a 0 and a 1 results in a 0, a 0 and a 1 results in a 0, and so on until we have compared all 32 bits. Notice that the last octet is all binary zeros. Because we are using a slash 24 subnet mask, the first three octets represent the network portion and the last octet is the host portion. Network addresses will always have binary zeros in their entire host portion, however long it is. In this case, the last eight bits. If we convert to dotted decimal, we can see that this host belongs to the network 192.168.2.0 24. Now let's determine the broadcast address for this network, which is used to send a message to all devices on the network at once. Whereas the network address had all binary zeros in the host portion, the broadcast address will have all binary ones. Since the host portion in this example is just the last octet, to determine the broadcast address, we keep the network portion the same and change the host portion to all binary ones. This results in a broadcast address of 192.168.2.255. Next, we'll determine the usable host addresses which lie between the network and the broadcast addresses. The first usable host in binary will be all binary zeros with a binary one at the end of the host portion. Converting to dotted decimal, this tells us the first usable host on this network is 192.168.2.1. Lastly, we'll determine the last usable host, which will be all binary ones with a zero at the end, the opposite bit pattern of the first usable host. Converting to dotted decimal, we get 192.168.2.254. 
Let's recap our calculations. We began with the host IP address of 192.168.2.38/24. Using binary anding, we determined that this host belongs to the network 192.168.2.0. Keeping the network portion the same, but placing all binary ones in the host portion, we determined that the broadcast address for this network is 192.168.2.255. Again, keeping the network portion the same but changing the host portion, we determined that the usable host range for assigning addresses to devices on this network is 192.168.2.1, which is one number up from the network address, and 192.168.2.254, which is one number down from the broadcast address. You can see that our original host IP address falls within this range. Things to keep in mind when working with IPv4 addresses. All IPv4 host addresses are 32 bits in length. A portion of the address represents the network that the host belongs to, and that starts at the left. The remaining part is the host portion, which identifies the host on the network. And there are two special reserved addresses on every network that can't be assigned to hosts. One is the network address, which is the lowest in the range of addresses and represents the network that all the devices belong to. And the other is the broadcast address, which is the highest address in the range and can be used for a shout out to all devices on the network at once. Thankfully, there are shortcuts you can take for calculating these addresses without having to convert to binary first but examining these addresses at the bit level should help you understand how network devices interpret them and also how the dotted decimal format is derived. Okay, um, in the past we've already, we've always had a section uh, that I've discussed and then a lot of times we have a video with the same name. In this case, they kind of did it in reverse order, but almost everything that they had talked about in the video kind of mentioned as a side item in the previous section. So um, let, let's look at it uh, one more time from my perspective. Um, so here we have a network cloud. And over here, this address is not associated with any device. This is the network address. Uh, so 192.168.10 network. Uh, again, all the host bits are zero. The one thing I didn't point out is they've kind of shortened the notation. So the slash 24 tells us this is a 255.255.255.0 uh, subnet mask. So that's just a real easy way to include information about the subnet mask instead of having to write out another decimal dotted uh, notation number. So here we have host. We have different interfaces. Uh, one thing that I like to stress is the router has an interface that's inside each network that it hosts that's directly connected to it. Often that is the first usable address in that network. So in the 10.0 network, 10.1 would be the first usable quote host IP. We do not have to assign that to be dot one, but many, many, many companies and facilities do that. Um, I have seen one or two where they'll use uh, dot 254, the highest usable IP address in this case, uh, but you could really use anything. But for consistency and convenience, often you use dot one. And then here we're showing the different IP addresses in that network. Uh, 10, 12, 55, 102, um, as they are assigned. So this is the logical topology with IP addresses shown. Uh, again, a network address is when we set all the host bits uh, to zero. Uh, so um, here, uh, for this subnet mask and this network shown up here, 192.168.10, all host bits zero, um, is how we get the dot zero network. The first usable address is one more than that, so that would be 10.1. We use that on the router interface. The last usable address, we didn't use it, but the last one, the biggest one we could use in a slash 24 network is 254. 
and then finally all host bits set to 1 would be 255. So our broadcast address is 192.168.10.255. Uh, so this type of stuff I refer to as network math, figuring out broadcast address, what network a host is in, uh, what's the network number, uh, that type of thing, how many usable hosts there are. Uh, that, that is network math. Uh, I do a lot of supplemental lectures on this. I've had other instructors, in particular Dana Brown, tell me that when she has students in her class and she gives them a pretest, she can look at their subnetting skills and go, this person had Wayne for 161, this person had Wayne, this person did not. Uh, because she said, my students definitely know how to subnet. It's a very important skill. And like I said, we'll cover it in the curriculum, but I will also have a number of supplemental lectures on network math and um, subnetting to, to teach you this hopefully uh, very, very well. Um, as far as host addresses, we have from the first usable host to the last usable host and all the numbers in between that can be used as IP addresses. And then finally, all ones is the broadcast address. Uh, so here's an activity that allows you to, based on the subnet mask and this host address, in decimal, dotted notation, and then in binary, can you go through and do the bitwise AND to get the binary value, and then can you convert those binary values um, to their, their numbers? Uh, I'll go ahead and point out one of the shortest um, shortcuts is you convert 10 to binary, you AND it with all ones, you're going to get the exact same thing back, and then when you convert it, um, it's going to convert back to 10 if you did this right. So really, you can bring this 10 and this 199 down to the bottom row. Um, you know, here they have you doing it in binary, doing it step by step, but in real life, as you get more comfortable with this, you'll just kind of shortcut it, and you'll know that a byte of all zeros is going to come down as zero, and a byte, another byte with all zeros is going to come down as zero. Um, so the network address for this should be 10.199.0.0. Uh, like I said, they're asking you to do a little more to, to make sure you understand that. Um, if you want to practice, you can click New Problem, and it will give you a new problem uh, with a different subnet mask. In this case, you have a subnet mask uh, that has some ones followed by some zeros within this byte. So you are going to have to convert this to binary for any octet that is not all ones or all zeros to do that. But often you just need to convert one octet uh, to go through the calculation. And then finally at the end of 11.1 um, we have a check your understanding um, on the IP version 4 address structure uh, which you can uh, do on your own. Uh, moving on to 11.2 uh, we've talked about this before but we're, we're going to review it. Um, you have different types of addresses that we'll discuss um, in the, the following uh, sections. Um, so um, in the case of unicast, uni means one. So this is one-to-one -one communications. Um, so what happens is um, we have a source, which is 4.1, which is this PC. It's going to send to 4.253, which is this printer. Um, so what's going to happen is it's going to send the information through the switch, and the switch knows, uh, we're assuming it has a fully populated MAC address table, so it's going to know just to send it out the port that actually has the printer. So that's one-to-one -one communications. Uh, broadcast is one to everybody, but the, the caveat, of course, is um, all means everybody on the same network. Um, so what's going to happen is um, a machine 4.1, again this PC, is going to send to the, the host, which is all 255s. So really what that's saying, you know, in reality, it would probably send to 172, 
16.4.255. So all the machines in the network. This is basically every machine in the world. But um, we've said the caveat is on the same network. So what happens is the switch sends it to everybody, but when it hits the router, the router is going to uh, ignore that and not pass it on. Um, I was really expecting them to put a red X on the packet. Uh, I don't know if and when we'll talk about this, uh, but one thing is important is um, collision domain is a collection of all the machines that may potentially be involved in a collision. We talked about collisions uh, previously. Uh, with full duplex, we don't have to worry about those as much as we used to. But there's also something called a broadcast domain. And a broadcast domain is if you take a machine, send a broadcast, and add all the machines that would actually see that broadcast, that collection of machines is referred to as the broadcast domain. So the broadcast domain in this case would be this, this whole network um, here. Uh, one thing uh, that we say is that switches expand or extend the broadcast domain. A broadcast hits the switch, it goes out all the other ports, uh, so it expands it. And we say that routers segment broadcast domains. So once you hit a router, the broadcast domain stops. Uh, so that's why what I'm drawing the circle around here is the, the, the broadcast domain. Um, IP directed broadcast domains are what I mentioned before, which in the case we have the network number followed by the host being set to all ones. Again, that's typically uh, what, what you're going to have. And then in the case of multicast, it is one to many. We have multicast groups. Um, which are um, IPs that start with, uh, they go from 224.0.0 all the way up to 239.255, 255, 255. So you'll see that here we have um, a couple of machines that are in the 224.10 uh, subnet. And when we send that um, multicast, it's actually going to go to every machine but every machine that is not in the multicast group is going to ignore it. So these two machines I pointed out at the bottom will process the packet where uh, these will ignore and discard it. Um, so here is uh, a broadcast. Uh, basically what's going to happen is when you start this, it's going to put a destination IP address and you need to click on all the machines that would see it. So for in this case, um, 225 is a multicast group. Um, so those two machines um, should see the packet. So if I check that up here, it says, yes, you're correct. Um, and then you click on new problem. So this, this is a kind of nice um, activity uh, to make sure you understand unicast, broadcast, and uh, multicast. Okay, moving on to 11.3, types of IP version 4 addresses. Um, so in the old days, um, before, you, you know, the, the, the 90s, uh, I think at UK we, we subnetted in uh, like 1984. Uh, but anyway, you had what was referred to as Class A, Class B, and Class C address ranges. So in the case of a Class A, uh, the IP starts with a zero. The very first binary digit is a zero. And it is a slash eight network. So using those conditions, uh, with the first bit starting with a zero, that means the values of that byte can go from 0 to 127. So there are only 128 Class A networks, but you have 24 bits 
So you have 2 to the 24 minus 2 addresses, which is something like uh, uh, 16 million. Uh, so you only have 127 of them, but if you have a class A, it's really, really big. Uh, class B starts with a 1 and a 0, so that's 128 going up, and it's a slash 16. So there's a medium number of Class B networks that are of medium size, like uh, 65,534 host. A Class C starts with 110 and is a slash 24. So there are lots and lots and lots of class C's. Um, whatever, um, well, 2 to the 24 minus 2, subtracting out however many class A and class B networks there are. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of them. But if you have one of those, you can only have 254 hosts in each. And then we have a class D that starts with 1110 in binary. Uh, that's uh, multicast, and then we have Class E, which starts with 1111, which is uh, reserved special use. Now then, in each of these ranges for Class A, Class B, Class C, we have something that is referred to as a private address uh, block. A private address is intended to be used on an internal network, for example, your home, or, you know, at KCTCS, or I'm sorry, BCTC, uh, we actually have our own private network, and other colleges probably have different private networks uh, that they use as well. But in Class A, if you have an IP that starts with 10, it is private. Private addresses are referred to as non-routable, because private addresses uh, do not pass um, through a router. Um, so anything that starts with 10 is a Class A private address. In Class B, anything that starts with 172.16 all the way up to 172.31 uh, is a private Class B network. And then in the case of Class C, anything from 192.168, uh, actually anything that starts with 192.168 is a Class C. Uh, address. Um, to route to the internet um, we need to have um, public IP addresses. Uh, so how do we handle this when I'm telling you that typically within your house or within your company you're using private IP addresses uh, but you need to route over the internet. And the way we do that is with something called network address translation. I can't remember if we've talked about that uh, before or not. But basically, you keep a table of if this machine in this home over here was talking to CNN.com on port 80, surfing the web on CNN.com, uh, this is going to go to the default gateway. And then the default gateway is going to keep a table that says this private address on this port is talking to CNN on port 80. It will then change the source address from being this PC to being the router. And it will be the public address that's on this side of the router that was probably given to you by your ISP. Not probably, is. So this will go off to CNN.com. The web page will come back and hit the router here. It will have a large dynamic port and it'll say, okay, who was I talking to on port 32803? Oh, I was talking to this PC. So let me route the packet to this PC so it makes it back to the web browser that initiated the HTTP uh, request. Um, down here, they're talking about a DMZ. Uh, basically, what happens is you have some machines that you want to protect very well within your intranet, that is a network within your company. So you have a router that protects that. Uh, then this router firewall, you also have some public IP addresses, 
And these may be things like ordering systems that your customers need to use or frequently asked questions or documentation that you need to get to. Um, so here they're showing a DMZ with one router. A lot of times you have a router here, a router here, and your DMZ is between the two, but you can form a DMZ uh, which on um, just one router if the router uh, supports that. Um, here's another one of those um, activities that is kind of like a game. Uh, notice that you start at five points. Uh, when you start playing things you decide whether or not you have a public or private IP address and whether you pass or block it. As you get it right you gain a point. If you get it wrong you lose a point. If you make it to 10 you win. If you make it to zero, you lose. So when you start this, it's like, okay, that's a public IP address, so I want to pass it. Um, next, um, this is a public IP address, I want to pass it. Uh, so you just do that over and over again, like I said, till you make it to 10. This is a public one, so we want to pass it. Um, so you can do that on your own. It's um, kind of a, a nice activity to make sure you understand. Uh, the public and private IP address spaces. Uh, they have some things that your curriculum calls special use IP version 4 addresses. Uh, the first one we talk about is the loop back address, uh, sometimes referred to as localhost. 127.0.0.1 uh, .0 is localhost. Uh, there are actually some IT um, t-shirts that say there's no place like 127.0.0.1 uh, kind of a play on the there's no place like home phrase. Um, if you in this case are pinging the local host your packet will go down the TCP IP stack make it to your NIC card it will not leave your machine and it will come back up uh, the IP uh, or the OSI TCP IP stack. Um, that just shows that you have the drivers installed, that your NIC is working, and uh, that type of thing. That's the purpose of the loopback address. Um, link local. Um, I really like to refer to this as a self-assigned IP. Uh, basically what happens when a machine comes up, if its IP address is not hard-coded, it tries to get it through DHCP, which we talked about before. Uh, if it does not get a response from a DHCP server, it will um, assign itself an address that's not in use. It starts with 169.254, and that will allow it to communicate with other machines on the same network. Um, so what happens is if this machine doesn't come up normally because maybe somebody fat fingered something in the DHCP server, um, you can log into another machine in this network, use the self-assigned IP to get to the machine, uh, to reboot it after you've corrected the mistake in TCP, I'm sorry, the DHCP server, or if it was a configuration error on the the local machine like you gave it a static IP but it was in the wrong network uh, it would uh, allow you to log into the machine and fix that problem okay the next section legacy classful addressing uh, we've already talked about that talked about class A class B and class C um, I also mentioned Class D, which is the multicast block, and Class E, which I said was reserved, experimental, uh, future use. So, um, when you have this, like I said before, Class A, you have 128. Um, each of these networks is 16 million. So, that uses about 2 billion of our IP addresses, or 50% 50 50 of the address space. Class B is another quarter. Class C is another eighth. And then uh, Class D and E together make up the last eighth of this pie chart. So, this kind of shows you how address uh, used to be spread out. Now, this is very, very wasteful, which we'll talk about primarily in the next chapter when we talk about IP version 6. But um, MIT 
has a class A, I think. Um, it starts with 15, is its uh, first octet. Um, so I asked my students, do you think MIT has 16 million devices that they need IP addresses for? And the students usually say no. Uh, then I say, okay, do you think MIT has a million devices? And a lot of people are saying no or, you know, not sure, but probably not. Um, so even if we say they do have need for a million IP addresses, they're wasting 15 million IP addresses that cannot be assigned to anyone else. Because early on, they were one of the, either the first three or first seven uh, things on the internet. They grabbed one of these um, class A's. Um, and down here, when you get to class C, there's two million of them. But they're relatively small, like I said, with um, 254 um, IP addresses. Uh, the next one talks about the assignment of IP addresses. Uh, this shows us that in the United States we have Aaron that does that, AFRANIC, APNIC, RIPE, LAC NIC um, are the different regions. Uh, at some point, I think it's in chapter 12, we'll talk about when these ran out or were given all the, the IP space. Um, and again, that's one of the major needs for IP version 6, but that's chapter 12. Um, here's another um, one that lets you go through and choose um, you know whether this is private or public IP after you go through and do this for everything you can click uh, check and it will tell you uh, which ones you got right and which ones you got wrong I didn't answer all of them but pretty sure the ones I picked are, are correct and then um, in this section you have the check your understanding uh, which you can uh, do on your own. Okay, here we're talking about network segmentation. And first we talk about why we might want to uh, segment things. And I said I didn't know if they did it, but right here, routers segment broadcast domains. If you don't have any routers in your network, uh, then every machine that sees a broadcast, that broadcast is sent to every other machine on the network, and it has to process that. So if you have hundreds or thousands of machines, that's a lot of traffic that is traversing your network and has to be um, processed. Um, so by putting routers in and segmenting, your network, in this case, into smaller broadcast domains, uh, you're reducing the amount of traffic that flows over the network and the traffic that the end devices have to um, propagate. So here they're saying that if I have one big LAN with 400 users, all 400 devices have to look at all other 400 devices uh, broadcast. Uh, Whereas here, if we create a 172.16.0 network and a 172.16.1 network, put 200 users here, 200 users here, uh, we can, um, you know, reduce the amount of broadcast traffic uh, that we see. Uh, so, um, why are some reasons we might want to segment domains in addition to cutting down on uh, the amount of broadcast traffic or maybe more accurately how might we make decisions of how to group these machines together. So the first one that's already selected is by location. So here you have a particular network you know the dot one, the dot two, the dot three, the dot four, and the dot five. It matches up with what floor it's on so if you see that you have a machine misbehaving that is in 10.0.4, you know it's on the fourth floor. Um, and you can investigate from there. So you're basically subnetting based on location. 
Another way to do this is to do it by job function. That is, put all the administration on one LAN, human resources on another, students on another, and accounting. Um, in addition to dividing these into smaller networks, cutting down on broadcast traffic, um, the other advantage is if you do security rules like access control list, you can say people on the accounting subnet have access to these accounting databases or these accounting file servers and nobody else does. Uh, so that's another advantage of dividing by group or function. And then finally you can subnet based on device type. I would say this is um, uh, they're not talking about you know switch router that type of thing but what they're doing for example is you put all printers in one LAN, you put all servers in one LAN, and then all of your other users or general host or PCs in a, a third LAN. So that's dividing by um, really device function, I would say. Um, so 1144 is a check your understanding. Um, you can do that on your own. And what we're going to do now is switch into um, some subnetting. Um, so they start out um, trying to make this easy by subnetting on an octet boundary. Um, so what would happen is, you know, in a slash 8, um, you would divide here, slash 16, you divide here, slash 24. Um, you would um, divide here. So basically um, what they're going to do is they're going to, in this first example, start with a slash 8 and they're going to convert it, the subnet mass, to be a slash uh, 16. So the division point between uh, the network portion and host portion is going to be in the middle. So if we divide here, um, we're going to have 10.0.0.1 all the way up to 10.0.255.254 as usable host. Uh, the network number is going to be um, all zeros, uh, and the broadcast is going to be all one. So 10.0.0.0 slash 16. 10.0.255.255 for the broadcast. Um, as we go through and basically increase the subnet bits, which are the second octet, we'd actually do these in binary order. So you'd have 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 255. Um, so those are the 256 networks that we're going to have. Uh, this is the network number. Setting the host bits to all one is going to be the broadcast. And then these are the number of usable hosts. Um, again, like I said before, um, 65,534. Uh, two to the 16 is 65,536, but you have to subtract the two off for the network or subnet address and the broadcast address. Um, if we do this uh, by converting the subnet mass from slash 8 to slash 24, um, our division point becomes the third octet. Um, so we go 0 to 255. When we add 1 to this, we get 1.0. We go all the way to 1.255 and then we go 2.0 and that would continue on all the way to our last subnet, which is 10.255.255.0. Uh, our broadcast is setting all the host bits, in this case the last octet, uh, to all ones. So it's the network number with .255. And then these are the 254, they say possible host, usually we'd say usable host. Uh, that, that you would have. Um, so dividing on the octet boundary is relatively straightforward. 
as we see as we divide within an octet we'll have to do more converting uh, from decimal to binary back back to decimal so what happens is if we have a slash 24 and um, we're going to borrow bits is what this is referred to so in the case before the first example we borrowed 8 bits in the second example, we borrowed 16 to keep it on uh, byte boundaries. But in this case, for example, we're going to take our uh, slash 24 and change that to a slash 25. So what they have here is the normal non-bolted in is our original network portion. We borrow one bit out of this octet, so we have one more bit in the network portion and then we have seven usable hosts. Uh, one thing, uh, kind of starting with the math here, the number of usable hosts is two to the n minus two, where n is the number of host bits you have. So two to the seventh is 128, um, minus two makes it 126. So if we borrow one bit, this bit can be either a zero or a one, so we have two subnets, each with 126 usable hosts. Now, here if we borrow two bits, um, our subnet numbers can be 00, 01, 10, or 11. Four possible combinations of ones and zeros and two uh, bits. So in this case, we have four subnets. So the number of networks we have is 2 to the n where n is the number of subnet bits. So in this case, by borrowing two bits, we create four subnets, each capable of having 62 hosts in them. All the way down to slash 30, where we're borrowing six bits. Two to the six is 64. So by doing this, converting from a slash 24 to a slash 30, we create 64 subnets. We have two host bits left, 2 to the 2 is 4, minus the network address, minus the broadcast address is 2. Um, if we subnet it any further, uh, we would not have any usable host on our network. So that's why slash 30 is the largest um, subnet mask um, you can have. Um, okay, 11.53 is an 8 minute, 8 second video. Uh, that talks about subnetting. Uh, like I said, I don't think you can hear enough about subnetting. That's why I have a lot of additional uh, lectures on it, and I am going to play this video here in line with uh, my lecture. That subnetting makes sense from the binary perspective. In other words, when we take the IP address and the subnet mask, and convert them to binary. I have the IP address on this row here. I have the subnet mask on this row converted to binary that the computer and the router are able to logically and or combine the IP address and the subnet mask and find the network address. In other words, this anding process is a logical process of anding. So a true and a true makes a true, 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 false and a true makes a false. And if we do that and and logically and the IP address with the subnet mask, we get the network address. So 192.168.1.10 logically anded with 255.255.255.0 produces the 192.168.1.0 network. This is at the core of the IPv4 address and subnet mask and subnetting in general. What about non-classful subnet masks? We've seen that the class C subnet mask is slash 24. We've seen the class B subnet mask slash 16 and the class A subnet mask slash eight. But what if we use classless masks? In other words, what if we have a slash 25 subnet mask? or a slash 18 subnet mask, creating a 255.255.192.0 subnet mask, or for that matter, a slash 12 subnet mask, 255.240.0.0. How does that work, and how does that change 
the networks that are created by the combination of the IP address and the subnet mask. This is called subnetting. I'll explain it using an example scenario. Let's start with a classic Class C network like 192.168.1.0 with a slash 24 or 255.255.255.0 subnet mask. If we want to subnet this 192.168.1.0 network, what we need to do is go into the subnet mask in binary, which we can see on this row right here. And what we do is to change the subnet mask, we borrow bits from the host portion of the address. This is done from left to right. So I could take this first zero here on the left and change it to a one. And now I've effectively changed the subnet mask from slash 24 to slash 25. In other words, if I convert this back to decimal, it's now 255.255.255.1.0. This completely changes the nature of the network. We now have a slash 25 subnet mask, and we only have seven host bits. So starting from a slash 24, we now have borrowed one bit from the host portion. We call this one bit a subnet bit. If we look at it from the perspective that we started with slash 24, We've added one bit, so we could say that subnet bits, we now have one bit, or two to the first power, creating two subnetworks. Host bits, we have seven zeros now, so host bits are two to the seventh power, or 128, minus two for the network address and the broadcast address, leaving us with a total number of possible hosts on the subnets of 126. So by borrowing one bit from the host portion of the address, we create two subnetworks, each subnetwork with 126 hosts. The subnetworks are the 192.168.1.0 slash 25 subnetwork and the 192.168.1.128 subnetwork slash 25. We can prove that this is the case using logical anding to prove how the router or a computer would take an IP address with this particular slash 25 subnet mask and derive the resulting network address. In other words, let's put in a host address. I'll put in the host address here and I'll say, let's put in the address 68. So I change this to a 68. So now we've got host 192.168.1.68. So this needs to be a one, that's the 64. And then we need to add the four bit here. So now we have 68. If we logically and the IP address here with our new subnet mask slash 25 here, let's see the result. We'll get a one, a one, a zero, 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 zero. So that's 192. And then here, the result is 10101168. And then all zeros here and a one. This is a one. And now if we look at this last octet, a false and a true makes a false. A true and a false makes a false. And then we get all zeros here. So the address, the network address, is the 192.168.1.0 network. So host number 68 is on the zero network. Well, this makes sense because if the next subnet is 128, if we put in a host address larger than 128, we'll see if it falls in this subnetwork. So let's change it slightly. I'll change the host address to 138. So now I'll change this, put that as zero. So there's a 128 bit. I'll make this a one. And I'll put a one here. So 128 plus eight plus two is 138. If we do the anding again, 
we see that a true and a true makes a true. And then we have falses all the way. And now the resulting network address is 128. So when we take the IP address with the slash 25 subnet mask, we see that the network address is 192.168.1.128. So we've created two subnetworks from the single 192.168.1.0 slash 24 network, we've created two subnetworks. The subnetworks go from 1.0 all the way up to 1.127 with zero being the network address and 127 being the broadcast address. And the second subnetwork starts at 128. So this is the network address because it's the first address all the way up to 255. And since this is the last address, this is the broadcast address. In other words, the first address in the subnet is the network address and the last address in the subnetwork is the broadcast address. This process is called subnetting. Okay, um, that was a good video on subnet mask. Um, this is followed by uh, another video uh, talking about subnet mask with something that Cisco likes to call um, the magic number. Um, I'm not going to play this video in line for a couple of reasons. Um, however, you should watch it on your own. Uh, the first reason is it's 14 minutes and 48 seconds. Uh, so a little bit long to be putting inside another lecture. Um, also, I think it's important that you understand the math that they just showed you and that I showed you prior to the, the video on how to, to do the subnetting. Basically, the magic number is something like if you know that your subnets um, are 32 uh, IP addresses, that is the usable host plus the network plus the broadcast equals 32. Um, then you would have dot zero, dot 32, dot 64. Your subnets would jump by that quote magic number. Um, I think that's a good way to double check if you see that they go 32, 32, 32, and then you made a mistake. And the next um, one was a jump of 128. Um, then you've done something wrong, at least the way we're talking about doing subnetting now, because we're borrowing bits and creating new subnets that are the exact same size. Uh, in the, the section 8 down here, VLSM, uh, section 8 of this module, uh, we'll start talking about where that's not true, because we use different subnet masks, but that's um, a little bit down the road. Uh, so, um, you, you should watch it nonetheless, but I'm not going to play it here. Uh, 11.5.5 is a packet tracer exercise uh, that deals with um, subnetting an IP version 4 network. Uh, one thing that I want to mention is, of course, there are a number of questions uh, throughout this which you need to supply your answers to. Um, but um, one thing is we've had a few packet tracers that have addressing tables at the top of them, in this case partially filled out. Um, as you go through and do this, uh, you should fill out the addressing table as well as answer all the questions within the instructions. And of course, as always, very important if there's an assessment items at the end, Make sure you choose assessment items when you check the activity and that you screen grab all of that and include that in your, your submission. Uh, that's how I tell that you did the lab and that you did all the steps that were necessary. I do plan to assign Packet Tracer 1155, uh, so watch for that to appear in Blackboard. Uh, as far as the sections, we're finishing up 11.5. It goes through 11.10. Uh, that tells me we're about halfway through the chapter. In reality, I think time-wise, we might be a little past the, the halfway point. Uh, but I figure this video is right at an hour, possibly over at this point. So I'm going to stop here, and then there will be... Uh,
another video lecture that covers approximately the second half of chapter 11.